Okay, so this, this um, panel is on theory and history. Any questions you have on things like praxeology and um, the a priori of argumentation or on Austrian economic theory, um, please ask away. Uh, and don't be afraid to ask anything. There are no free speech zones here. There are, there are no speech codes. Just be civil. Uh, back there in the blue, uh, Peter McCaffrey. Uh, hello, all. So, as I'm sure you noticed, uh, uh, I've been, lotting, or been asking a lot of kind of weird questions so far. There is a theme um, that I've been wanting to ask about, uh, and it's the relationship between language and economics, or really the, the relationship between language and human action. So what is that relationship? And if, we're, if one were to study that relationship, is that the job of an economist exactly, or would that would that be some uh, maybe like a different field of praxi of praxicology? Uh, so yeah, that, that's the question. Uh, yeah, and that's open ended to anybody who feels like answering. Uh, well, I, I would think that the relation between language and action would be more a topic for philosophy and linguistics. Uh, there are some philosophers like Donald Davidson who have the view that uh, thought must take place in language that uh, only uh, entities that speak a language can have thought. That's a controversial view. But I wouldn't think those questions are addressed by praxeology. It's more that it would be just taken as a given that we use language, but the nature of that relationship, I think, would be much more of a philosophical problem. I should say I'm, I'm good at evasions, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> okay, right in front of Peter McCaffrey. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> uh, this is a question directed towards the whole panel, except Dr. Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what are your thoughts on argumentation ethics? <laughs> as, as Hans once um, replied to uh, a speaker who, whose uh, train of thought he, wasn't, he didn't like, <laughs> no, I'm only... <laughs> no, I... I'm sorry, Hans. <laughs> Does anyone besides David want to address that? <laughs> he, he, he said except for me. Oh. I know that Murray Rothbard thought it was a good um, supplementary argument to the argument from natural rights. I mean, he hadn't really worked through it. And, and I, I, I sort of like it. You know, you can use, it's a good rhetorical device, but um, I haven't thought about it that deeply, so I really can't answer. I think that's probably true of everyone. I, touch that. <laughs> I, I would say if since people, <laughs> people, people keep asking, people keep asking. Uh, as I mentioned in my talk on uh, Hans Hoppe's philosophy, I think the important thing before we try to criticize an argument is to try to understand it, and that was what I was trying to do in the uh, in the lecture. So. Uh, I think that what my views on the argument is more important is what are your views on it, and you should think about it and come up with your own conclusions about it. And I would say I, I've, uh, I would find it, it not making joke, joking aside, I would find it difficult to answer the question because I've never been in the years I've looked at it, I've never been able to understand all the, the argument fully. I think he comes up with the right conclusions, but I've never been able to understand the structure of the argument in a way that I'm satisfied with. Yet another great evasion. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So my question is uh, to Professor Jonathan Newman. So, uh, 
I've been uh, going back to the readings and to my notes about the boom and bust, like this whole cycle theory. And uh, we saw how the Hayekian triangle basically deformates when uh, the, the interest rates are artificially lower than uh, they should be. How people overconsume and how people overinvest. But uh, I, I still can't see, I, uh, like, it's not clear to me what, what is it that makes the interest rate go up and then cause the bust. Uh, so just to clear up one uh, small thing is that it's a it's a theory of malinvestment, not of overinvestment. So they they start pursuing the wrong lines of production. It's not that they're investing too much just in general. Mises makes that that really clear. In terms of what eventually uh, makes interest rates change, that could that could be a number of things. It, it could be uh, consumers and producers, their own time preferences. Just they start overriding what the monetary policy authority is trying to do. Or it could be the monetary policy authority starts, you know, they let up on the gas as the, they like to use these sorts of car and engine analogies. So, um, it, I mean, really any one of those things. But a, a, a similar question has to do with, would it be possible for the central bank to just keep lowering interest rates, like keep uh, inflating the money supply and pushing interest rates down and then forever forestalling the, the bust? Could that happen? And the answer is no. You would you would end up in what Mises called the crack up boom. So you could you could have you could just end in hyperinflation. You could end in just a destroyed economy that way. Um, or uh, even with the even if they just sort of maintain the same pace of increasing the money supply, that you you would still get the case where in the middle stages of production, the prices of those capital goods are going to be much higher than what those the entrepreneurs that started the projects anticipated. So the, the, what they thought would be profitable will turn out to be unprofitable. So the, the, I mean, there's many different cases where you would get the, the boom to turn into a bust. Thank you. Hello. Thank you all for your guys' uh, talks throughout the week. I've really enjoyed them. My question specifically when it comes to theory and method, it's open for anyone. What would you say has been one of the best critiques of uh, the Austrian theory, the Austrian method that you guys have kind of come across? And uh, how would you guys kind of address it or respond to it, if, if at all? Uh, well, one uh, important critique is the one, the article by uh, Robert Nozick called On Austrian Methodology that uh, is reprinted in his collection, Socratic Puzzles. And uh, he had a number of difficulties that he raised with with uh, Austrian economics, he thought uh, he had an argument against time preference theory, and he had various other criticisms. And uh, Walter Block had a long paper replying to him, and I have some posts in my Friday columns commenting on various points in Nozick's uh, paper. I think that would probably be the best criticism. There, there are other people who've criticized Austrian methodology. Like, uh, I think Brian Kaplan is one who has a paper on that. So that would be one to look at, I think. <clears throat> Just to add, in similar to what David said about Hans Hoppe's argumentation ethics, I mean, a lot of the better known, especially in this sort of crowd critiques of Austrian method uh, are based on pretty fundamental misunderstandings I think there are a lot of critics who, you know, it just seems so bizarre to them or so different from the positivist approach they're used to. They pick a few words and phrases from Mises or Rothbard out of context and then sort of spin a detailed reply to something that Mises or Rothbard didn't actually claim. And frankly, I think Brian Kaplan's paper is a lot like that. Most of what he claims are mistakes in the Austrian method or just misunderstandings of what Austrian economics is and what praxeology is trying to accomplish. So I just had a question. Um, I remember reading that there was some associate of Mises, I think it might have been Alfred Schutz, who was um, a phenomenologist. And I wanted to know um, what sort of connection there was in his work between praxeology and phenomenology. <clears throat> yes, you're, you're right that uh uh, Alfred Schutz was a leading phenomenologist and he attended Mises' seminar. And Mises refers to his uh, book, Phenomenology of the Social World, in, I think, in Human Action. I think there are 
uh, lecture notes where Mises praises Edmund Husserl and the phenomenology, phenom phenomenological movement, but I think it would be a mistake to tie uh, Austrian uh, economics and praxeology to a particular philosophical school. It was one of the, it was just one of the, uh, the philosophical schools that uh, uh, Mises was familiar with. Uh, one way in which I think it would be useful perhaps is that one could use uh, phenomenology against the view of the logical positivists that uh, we don't really, can't really get anywhere through conceptual analysis is that just tautology, tautologies. And uh, so I think that would be useful. And also one of the, as you know, one of the most famous, the most famous criticism of the uh, logical positivist verifiability criterion of meaning was that the criterion itself is neither analytic nor uh, verifiable. And that criticism was, I think, first formulated by Roman Ingarden, who was a phenomena Polish phenomenologist who was a student of Husserl. Uh, I have a question about uh, models within the Austrian school. So one of the main criticisms that Austrians have of the mainstream is uh, grossly over-assumed models, right, where the assumptions are not realistic. However, though, I, I, you know, I have noticed that there have been some Austrian models. So what uh, is the place for models within the Austrian school? Is it just a pedagogical or teaching tool, or does it have any other re uh, relevance? Sure. I'll, I'll just uh, reference w one of the, the readings that I recommended at the beginning of, um, of uh, my talk on statistics was uh, Realism and Abstraction in Economics um, by Roderick Long. And here in that paper, he talks about the, the types of abstractions, or the, the, the sorts of assumptions that are made in models, and he compares the mainstream economics to Austrian economics. And the main, one of the, the differences the, is precisive versus non-precisive abstractions. So the sorts of abstractions that are made in mainstream economics are of the sort that you have to, you have to assume that the consumer has a lot more knowledge, or, or you have to assume that uh, the the goods that they're consuming are continuous, and so they can take a, a, a derivative of their indifference curve and find the tangency to their budget constraint. All sorts of very precisive, specific sorts of things. But in, in, in the way that we theorize about human action in Austrian economics, it's non-precisive. So we leave the, the particulars unstated, and the fact that they're unstated doesn't really influence the conclusions that we draw. So we can, like I said, we can come up with the the law of diminishing margin utility without specifying what what good the consumer is 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 thinking about is considering so i recommend you check up check out that paper by by roderick long um, I'll, I'll also mention that in the cases where we do make precisive abstractions in austrian models like the evenly rotating economy has some pretty stringent assumptions built in there um, it's for a specific purpose so we're we're not trying to model the real world with the evenly rotating economy. With the evenly rotating economy, there's a there's a specific theoretical goal, which is to to analyze to 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 piece out what what is interest and what is profit, and what happens when what happens when we take all uncertainty away. What sorts of return uh, remains in the economy? So it's not it's not to simulate the real world. It's to arrive at a particular theoretical conclusion. Well, also, just to follow up on what Jonathan. Um, said, uh, when we use the ERE um, as, as uh, what Mises has called an imaginary construct, the propositions that, that, that allows us to derive regarding entrepreneurship, on, uh, that, that profit is a return to entrepreneurship under uncertainty, not one of the propositions in which we state the uh, theories about the real world entrepreneur and profits, not one of those propositions has anything to do with the evenly rotating economy. So as Mises said, we have to drop or as Rothbard said, we drop, we drop that, that uh, imaginary construct when we actually state the theory. It just helps us to derive the theory. Uh, and one other, uh, one other example is um, a world of specific factors that Rothbard uses 
in, um, in talking about the structure of production, where everybody can only do one and only one thing. Okay, and every piece of land can only be used in one and only one production process. He doesn't think that's the real world. What he derives there is to show that prices determine costs. So that if nobody wants diamonds, then the value of diamond mines fall to, falls to zero. So you, you can see it very clearly. So it's sort of a heuristic device. Um, but once again, we drop that assumption. We don't theorize about the labor market on the, ba on, uh, on the belief or, or assumption that, that uh, laborers can do one and only one thing. But it's, these models, if they're correctly constructed, can do tremendous work and allow you to derive theory. And but Patrick Newman and I, we, we sort of came upon this because we're writing a book on, on, on Rothbard's writing of man, economy, and state and how his thinking evolved. And he's very clear when, when you look at his notes and stuff that he's you know, deriving these models or, or you know, making these assumptions, which have to be dropped um, when it comes to stating the positive propositions of, of the theory. It, can I just uh, add to that, yeah. too? The, um, and that's, that's one of the, I think, the, the dangers. Uh, because, uh, I'll put it this way. Austrians will never use the conclusions that are arrived at through this abstraction as any type of benchmark for a welfare criteria upon which to, to, to base policy. Where, uh, you know, uh, economic policy uh, drawn on, you know, drawing on uh, neoclassical models are used all the time as a justification for policies such as antitrust and regulation and everything else. And so the, you know, always sticking to realistic economics would help us not to lose our way in, in the creation of destructive policy that happens when you use artificial models as a benchmark for reality. Okay, I'll take uh, two questions on this side. Yes, in the front row. And then back. Um, I have a question just about the entire Austrian economic theory in general. So it all makes complete sense, but it's really hard to imagine this to happen in the current political state that we're in. So my question is, do you think that this the switch to a completely Austrian economic government would be have to be instantaneous for it to all work together, like the story of the fi finance minister in Germany, or do you think that it could be a gradual shift? Well, I know um, Murray Rothbard's view on this was that you, know, you ask for the whole pie. You want everything to change immediately, but you know that that's not going to happen in the real world because of political factors and social factors and so on. So you don't specify what steps should be taken first. But any time, you know, wherever there's popular unrest about high taxes or, or welfare, you jump in and, and you make the argument. So you push back, you, you, you try to roll the state back where you have the greatest opportunity. Political opportunism is sort of the watchword of, of, of the strategy that Rothbard pushed, and I, and I completely agree with that. Um, whereas some people say, well, before we get rid of welfare for the poor, we want to get rid of corporate welfare. Well, if, the, if people become so outraged about welfare for the poor, but they aren't yet outraged about corporate welfare, um, then you get rid of that. I mean, then you, 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 jump on, you, know, you jump on the bandwagon and you push it forward. Okay, so, um, so yeah, we're not gonna get, you're not going to get the, the whole enchilada. Um, you, call, you ask for it, you keep pushing for it and, and pointing out that, look, wherever we, it's piecemeal, we, we win, or things are better, so let's make them a lot better. But you, you, you take the pieces that you can get, that you can grab fr from the state and the cronies and so on. And from the point of view of sort of positive analysis, I mean, obviously there's a lot of uh, literature using Austrian economic theory to explain mm -hmm. all of the current interventions and what impact they have and what it would look like if this one were relaxed or that one. You know, uh, a lot of things that you've heard this week, uh, Rothbard's uh, The Third Part of Man, Economy, and State publishes Power and Market is a theoretical analysis of government intervention. You know, Rothbard's History of the Great Depression would be another example. And one that I find very interesting is uh, he, he wrote an article uh, right after the um, collapse of communism, I think it was published in 90 or 91, on kind of post-Soviet transition. How do you go about privatizing formerly state-owned enterprises? Right, so I mean, he, he would say, oh, these should immediately, you know, everything, sh everything should be privatized immediately for the highest overall you know, uh, you know, social societal well-being, but 
if that's not politically feasible, what is the best way to sort of move in that direction? Uh, and you can do that by looking at experiences of privatization in history. So I've discussed this with you a little bit before, some of you a little bit before already, and um, I just wanted to expand on it a little bit. So uh, this question is kind of in two parts. First of all, why did Mises say that uh, in primitive economies like uh, Native American small villages and things like that, uh, it would still be possible for them to economize and calculate essentially without money? And kind of on the flip side of that, uh, do you think it would be possible for an isolated individual to economize in an otherwise uh, complicated, complex capital structure? Like say someone was left alone in New York City and was surrounded by all of the, the capital structure that already exists there, but for some reason they were the only person in that world, would they be able to economize? I've been arguing with Jonathan uh, Newman on this. <laughs> yeah. I, think, I think it's important to recognize that people economize all the time whenever they act, right? So it's not so much can they economize or do they economize, it's, it's a matter of can they economize as effectively as they might in all circumstances. So, I mean, I, people, you, you don't, in, 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 in a small, more simple uh, entity, uh, unit, household, whatever, um, you know, people survived without capitalism, and so it can be done um, there, it's just, it's just the, 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 complex, the complexity limits how effective one can be in allocation of resources uh, without calculation. And so I think that um, Mises is just recognizing the fact and making allowances that you, it's not as if if we, if, if we don't have calculation everything, everything crumbles. If we don't have calculation, a complex modern economy crumbles, and then everybody, then a, then a lot of people die. But the people who survive have to pick up the pieces and kind of go forward. But as they go forward, they're going to be economizing as they go. It's just going to be much more rudimentary. That's my off the cuff remark. And I might, may I say, by the way, this bow tie was purchased not at Walmart, but was purchased downstairs, just for you know. <laughs> One thing I would add also on why Mises says uh, in primitive societies could economize, the, I think a key part of his answer is that in the primitive societies there isn't much change going on. So and if you look, for, uh, he wrote his uh, preface to Louis Baudin's book, The uh, Socialist Empire, The Incas of Peru. He says in there, well, uh, that, the economy there could continue indefinitely had it not been uh, uh, overthrown because they were a static society. So for him, uh, a calculation argument depends on that there's a change in the economy, and that's where calculation principally comes in. What's the Salerno-Newman disagreement on this issue? I, uh, if Stalin was the commissar of all of the United States and had the whole capital structure and all the goods and so on, my, uh, and let's assume the goods are, are scarce to him, meaning that he wants to do certain things with them, these, and he has robots at his command to do whatever he, whatever he wants, um, then he would not be able to, to know the opportunity costs of the infinitude of production possibilities that, that confront him. So, so, you know, the whole thing would break down. Um, and I think Newman's... No response to that, but it's wrong. And my response is that he would make decisions. He would demonstrate some sort of preference. Like, so he would do something, even if it's like really complicated. And, and in the process of making those decisions, then we see he has demonstrated a preference for this line of production, that consumer good, as opposed to another. So, so the idea is that we we can't just say that he would just like. It's like a bird and his ass sort of problem. He wouldn't just sit there and just think forever about how do I do this. He would make some sort of decision. We would have to say, as economists, he made this decision. Therefore, he's saying I prefer this to that. And my my, my response to that, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm the academic vice president, I'm older than him. Also, <laughs> uh, it was uh, actually it's not a response. I mean, it, it's sort of a movement in his direction. Mises is somewhere in human action says something like, uh, even Robinson Crusoe uh, could not um, act in the same way as 
he, he would if he could calculate. So That's on page 244. On what was that? That's on page 244 if you're interested. Yeah, because I, I told him and he found it. Yeah. yeah. That's what young guys do. Okay. Uh, left side. Left side. Uh, in the back, Tam. So I wanted to ask two, two questions. Um, number one, I realized that a lot of research that Austrian economists do is either about theory or trying to explain the theories of Mises and Rothbard. Are there some opportunities to develop new theories in Austrian economics, number one? And number two, Austrian economists are generally libertarians, but no one seems to accept, I think, power in markets. I don't think that we have thought about, are there opportunities to think about the praxeology of hostile action or the praxeology of violence? Because I think that is very crucial that we should understand that sometimes hurting somebody might be a means to an end, and it might be the only means to an end in certain situations. Uh, Mises does, on the, on your second point, um, I, maybe David can tell us the page number, but I mean, <laughs> Mises does talk about, so, so praxeology is somewhat broader than, you know, Mises uses the word catalactics to describe the analysis of purposeful human action when calculation is possible, but so, so so there is a there is such a thing as purposeful human action. I don't know whether we want to call it economizing or not to, to get in this that dispute outside the realm of economic calculation. So the Crusoe economy would be one example, or uh, maybe in the qu the question here about you know the zombie apocalypse and there's only one person left in New York City. So there are no I mean there's there are prices of the immediate past. But there, there's no way to, for prices to emerge going forward. I mean, I, I think Mises thought it was not very well developed, but that you could apply praxeology to war, conflict, violence, the household economy, Robinson Crusoe, you know, purposeful action in a realm without prices. I think, I, I think Matt McCaffrey has something about um, war and, and military action. Yeah. Yes, he does. And I've, I've written an article called The Logic of War Making, in, in which I try to make a little bit of progress um, on Mises' point. And also, just I think this past year, I read Friedrich von Wieser's Social Economics. And he tries to make some strides in bringing in the no, kind of a broader notion of power and how that can have an impact. Um, I don't know that I understood his points well enough to yeah. say whether he succeeded, but, but certainly there have been attempts this direction. Yeah. Okay, I, we're going to have to stop I, now. I was going to oh. rap, say oh. something. I just, I, I think the question... No, we have to stop. Oh, no, go ahead. <laughs> I think the, the question reveals, I think what we need is a praxeologically informed sociology. I mean, we, we, we have to recognize that the praxeology doesn't just apply to economics. It applies to all areas where we can study human action. So we need, if there's... If, if, if there's socio sociologists, budding sociologists out there, use praxeology to get effect. Okay, thank you.